All right. Well, so it looks like the camera's not going to work for me right now, which I think is fine. So I am going to try to make a game in Tabletop Simulator. Uh, overall, it's not a terribly difficult uh, concept. The gist of it is you want to have an idea of what you're going to do. <clears throat> if there's a, a pre-made game already that you are interested in creating, then it's that much easier. If you just have an idea in your head, well then, you know, obviously you need to figure out what pieces you need, but the, the flexibility of Tabletop Simulator will let you uh, modify it on the fly <clears throat> if you are prototyping a game, if you are creating a game just for friends. Um, you know, the, the design doesn't need to be nailed down perfectly. Um, you can sketch up some, some pieces, boards, cards, things like that in Microsoft Paint, or if you have a, a more professional tools, you can use those instead. Um, and as you play test your creation with friends, if you decide you want to add, uh, you know, markers or tokens or anything like that, uh, all the pieces are available to you. And then, of course, if you decide you want to take things the next step and start making custom objects, that is also something that's available to you. Um, which I don't think we're going to be working on today. This is going to be more or less just getting up to a crawl with whatever game you decide you want to make. So, you know, as far as making games go, this is a pretty simple and overly simple example. But if you just had an idea for, I want to make a game where you flick a marble at pieces on the table. Well, it's as easy as putting in a marble object and putting in all of the different kinds of objects, which is fun in its own right. You know, it's a messing around type game. And then from that point, you can implement some form of score. <clears throat> There's lots of tools over on the side that let you type out like score. Uh, you know, um, victory point values or something. And you can say one point for cube, two points for, you know, pawn, three points for rook. And then you could say, you know, <clears throat> you get you get the points for just knocking the thing off the table maybe without having the marble go off if the marble goes off then you lose any points that you would have scored but so that's just to give you the general idea now uh, tabletop simulator does offer the option of adding in custom items it's just it gives you a bunch of blanks and you have uh, <clears throat> the option of uploading images, PDFs, uh, even potentially models. If you're a 3D modeler, you can upload that. Um, I'm not generally a 3D modeler, so I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, but So we made a card game, so we'll look at making uh, a card game, and we'll, we'll sort of recreate uh, how we made uh, sellouts within Tabletop Simulator. So I'll just pull this off to the side one second. I don't want to give away any of my secrets. So uh, when you go to create a custom item from this custom menu, it'll pop up with a, with a uh, dialog box saying you can upload 
different items. So if you have cards already pre-made, card images already pre-made, you can upload them. The face, uh, you can... The face is what's going to be on the front of the card, and the back is obviously what it's going to be on the back of the card. So actually, let's do the back first. Desktop. People are yelling outside. Sound angry. Uh, so I tried to upload it and it's asking me if I want to store the files in locally or on the network. I just selected locally for this uh, section. And it's a sideways card because I'm doing the problem card, which is you hold it at 90 degrees the way you would for any other card. Uh, the face, we will grab an image that's just the front of the card. I'll keep that local as well. And I'll import that. <laughs> well, apparently, Tabletop Simulator is just going to crash. Uh, I thought I'd give a short tutorial about how I made the cards in Sellouts for Tabletop Simulator. I'm not sure why the game just crashed. Yeah, we get to start over. It's a happy little accident. Uh, so let's... Oh, that's the back. Whoops. Throw in the, throw in the back of the card. We'll just throw in the blank just to make it easy. And it's a sideways card, so make that make sure that's checked. And there's a couple of different options if you have uh, artwork for hex cards or circle cards. Those are also options. So we can import that, and boom. So it didn't crash this time, and we have a problem card. <clears throat> and um, because the image that was used has... Oh, well, that looks wrong. <laughs> Well, anyway, so there was a, what would you call that, orientation issue, which is not a big deal. Uh, just the file that I was using was pre-rotated to account for uh, when I was trying to upload to Tabletopia. Um, but, but that's the basic idea. So now we've got a problem card. I'm curious if we can write. No, we got to write directly on the table. Okay. So, it sort of gives you an idea of. It's Hari. Thank you for the subscription. Subscribing to the channel you've been streaming to for the past day and a half. <laughs> Thank you for the Prime, man. Um, so, we can take this a step farther and import uh, an entire deck, um, which it's a little bit more involved. <clears throat> oh, now you won't get out. It's okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, this process gets a little more involved. And to make a game like Sellouts, where you have uh, a few hundred cards, um, you do have to sort of play around with how things are set up. 
uh, to the point where you have to provide uh, a template for the faces if you want the faces to be different. Um, and I think you can even provide, you can set it up so that each card back is different. If you, if you for example, had a set uh, uh, for your card game where you had 50 cards and they all had different backs and all had different fronts, that's something you can do with just this one dialog box. That's not really an issue. You don't have to go through the process of adding a single custom card and then making a deck out of that. And so what that ends up looking like uh, <clears throat> you'll have to make an image sort of like this where all your cards are written out uh, and they're all put side by side into a single grid. Now the limitation here as powerful as this tool is is that you can only in uh, Tabletop Simulator go as many as uh, 70 cards. I guess 69 cards. The last card slot is used for the hidden card. So that would be like the black image uh, down in the bottom corner. Um, so I've already got this uploaded. This is actually the this here is actually the image that's uploaded to uh, Imager that our our sellouts game uses. No, not for backs. We put that in fronts because these are the front of the cards. Um, we don't have unique backs. They're all going to be the same. And since this is <clears throat> the feature cards, we'll grab the back for the feature cards. We'll keep it local for now. And I don't know how many cards there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so we do have 70, uh, 70 slots here. So that all works out very well. Um, they're not sideways. The back is, instead of using the last slot on face image for hidden card, the back image will be used. Um, so I'm not going to check this because I believe that means the instead of using the last slot on the face image for the hidden card, the back image will be used. Okay. So I think if I had checked that uh, this would use or if I left that unchecked, it uses whatever's in the bottom corner uh, for what shows up when you flip the entire deck over. Um, we could have put another image there, or if we had checked that box, maybe back is hidden. Let's try that. No, okay. Never mind. But. That option aside, which I'm not sure what it does offhand, um, it's a very powerful tool if you have artwork or something similar available to you to be able to make a game. Um, and you can see in the amount of time it took me to create one single card, albeit wrong, you can also create an entire deck of 70 cards as long as you have the artwork laid out properly. Um, you know, when you're when you're making a game, there's there's all these different options available. Oh, I already did that. Um, you know, we can we can spin up paint. And let's make let's make a board. Let's make a board that has let's say four corners. Just make it a thousand by one thousand. Turn off that aspect ratio so we can actually get what we're trying to do. Uh, and then, you know, we could just go nuts with it. 
Um, let's make a game where you have to, you have four quadrants. of different colors. And let's say it's it's some kind of territory control game. Okay. Yeah, nothing crazy. If you're just making a game to prototype, or if you're just trying to have fun with friends, none of this has to be super professional. I almost feel like I accidentally almost created the Windows logo here. Um, four corners. So we've got that now. And for our custom board, we can then just import that four corners board that we made. Import. And there you go. Uh, with, with very little work, we've already got a working board for what we're trying to do. Um, and then hello, let me select Oh, that's right. Boards are kind of weird in Tabletop Simulator. Um, I think they start out as locked? Or something happened. Yeah, so this board started out as locked, so I just needed to go into the right-click menu and unlock it. Not at all on purpose. <laughs> um. So from here, so we've got a board, you know, and, you know, very basic board. Maybe, maybe we have each player gets four pawns. Uh, orange. And as far as the game itself, you know, probably, uh, your game would have more complex uh, figures or images or things like that, but for prototyping it really doesn't matter. So maybe this is some kind of game where each each player um, has the option... No, don't need that. They have the option of moving one of their pawns to a neighboring space. Or, you know, a diagonal space or what have you. And let's say you can only move one at a time. But if you're ever outnumbered in a space, that territory then belongs to uh, whoever has the majority. Maybe that's the kind of game you want to make. But with a very with a very small amount of clicks, you know, we've created the, the basis for a board game. And then because of the objects menu with the components you have all kinds of resources available at your disposal. Um, you know, maybe the, maybe it's not just about being able to move one of your pieces outside. You grab a dice, and now you have to move one of your pawns so many spaces. So let's say I'm the green player. I have to move <clears throat> one pawn one space. Well, to maintain control of my territory, I can move one of my guys back. Then as the yellow player, <clears throat> I rolled a six. So you know I can move this guy one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, and a uh, very basic concept, but you can see how with the addition of an extra game piece, <clears throat> how the entire system uh, could change how the entire game could change uh, to make the game more complex, to, to make the game more strategic, or to make it more luck-based. Um, and there's all kinds of pieces that are already available for you to use. So if I wanted to 
let's say, give someone the opportunity to summon a centaur into the game, there's a centaur piece available in the RPG kit set. And this is only the tools that are available from um, the game itself. I believe if you go to the Steam Workshop, it gives you the opportunity to download uh, extra pieces that other players have made. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the really, really neat things about uh, Tabletop Simulator is just the, the absolute uh, flexibility of it all. I don't know what you'd use any of this for, but it's all available, you know? Uh, there's different boards you can work off of. If you just need a grid, you can play up a chess board or a go board. Uh, or again, go and paint, make your own to suit your needs. Uh, for keeping track of scores, maybe you could introduce chips. Or, I don't know if these are colorable. Nope, they come out white. Is that colorable? That is colorable. No, comes out white again. Um, but so the sort of the magical thing about uh, board games in general is when you've got game components, you could really use them however you want. Um, and part of the reason why there's so many games out there is because that's exactly what people do. You know, you don't have to reinvent dice for every single game that's out there. There's already, you know, 12 different sizes of dice that are standard. You just got to figure out a new way to use them. Um, pawns can represent any number of things. If you wanted to do territory control, if you wanted to do resource management, you know, this pawn is just as easily uh, a character for a player to move, or this <clears throat> pawn could just as easily be um, a resource, you know, wheat. If you want to get a little bit more specific, you can create your own pawns. Or you just import a picture. I apologize, I don't I probably don't have X. Uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Well, and so that's the kind of uh, the kind of flexibility you have available. If you have a picture, um, that image that I used when I imported it into the game, uh, it ended up having a transparent background because I made it a PNG uh, where I just had the guy cut out, and so then it instead of just looking like a rectangle, it looked like. Uh, almost like a cardboard cutout, which might might be a little more pleasing in your chosen aesthetic. Um, so you really have a lot of room to sort of make the game your own. You could take it one step further if you know 3D modeling. I might have some 3D models. Let me... Let me look... I don't have a lot of experience with this, so we'll see if it works out. Go into figurines now. Where is it? Custom model. <clears throat> Use one of these 3D models that, that Windows has built in. The as path.
and it gives you a lot of different options uh, as far as what the item is that you're importing um, and it gives you options as to materials, specular intensity uh, that makes it shiny or not shiny uh, lots of things I'm not going to mess with right now it will cast a shadow can we import that? where'd it go? is it just really tiny? oh maybe it didn't maybe it didn't work maybe this isn't the right kind of file Okay, so it is the wrong kind of file. Do I have any OBJs or raw ends? I don't think so. Three and a half. <clears throat> Let's see. I know I've been working with 3D files recently because I've been doing 3D printing recently. STL files. It probably does not accept STLs. Well, open with. How can I open this? Well, let's try to open it in Paint 3D. Maybe this will have the desired effect. So I found this 3D printable object in on the website thingiverse.com. Um, I downloaded it as an STL, so I'm going to see if I can save it as a 3D model. Can I save it as an OBJ? No. Okay, so Paint 3D does not have that ability. Maybe it would be an export? No. Alright. Let me see. There's a quick way to convert STL to OBJ. Um, as far as all this goes, uh, it's also, if you have access to a 3D printer and you happen to have uh, 3D models for the game that you're trying to work on, it's also a really easy way to go from uh, modeling your game and prototyping it in a Tabletop Simulator to printing out pieces for your game if you have custom pieces um, and then you can incorporate it into a real prototype so it has that extra layer of authenticity so you're not just working with uh, pieces of paper cut out and glued to cards or, or what have you. converter the token that I'm trying to upload is actually something that someone else designed for the game Mansions of Madness um, and it's something that I was considering printing just so you can see what I'm doing off camera. I just found these uh, STL to OBJ converters online. So I'm going to try these out. Copy 
this path. So we'll throw our OBJ file path in there. Did it still not work? So it is a figurine. Cannot connect to destination host. All right, well, not a huge deal. So I won't be covering that <laughs> for this little tutorial. Um, so I don't know exactly what asset bundle would be. There's also help tools it's the most advanced, fully featured asset type for Tabletop Simulator. An asset is created in Unity and then exported in a special format to be imported to your game. So that's neat. Um, I can't think of anything I'd use it for just in the moment that I've learned about it. Uh, but that's also an item that's available. Custom PDF if you wanted to do your rules. Um, a PDF of your game in some other capacity. Uh, you know, the world is your oyster. If you can imagine it, you can create it. Just like that, our rules are in the game. And it allows you to flip pages. I should probably incorporate that into the actual sellouts version of uh, sellouts copy of Tabletop Simulator. It gives you a nice beefy uh, rule book uh, that you can look at, admire in all its glory. Um, and it's super easy to create a PDF if you have access to um, any word processor. Uh, Microsoft Word, uh, Google Drive, uh, very easy to export your documents to PDF. So it's almost trivial to make a PDF that you can import this way. And the tools themselves make it really easy uh, to incorporate your PDF. And it's even auto-sized. So this PDF itself is two pages long. It's the um, the exterior of our rule book and then the interior of the rule book and it's all laid out very nicely <clears throat> this is you just read you know top to bottom flip the page and continue uh, dice if you need special dice you can create your own dice they they have specific ways that the dice need to be laid out when you are importing uh, a dice image, uh, which I'm not going to cover. I don't think we need specific dice, but you can see the way that they're laid out uh, to some extent. If you wanted to just create a die that does colors, something like that we could incorporate into our game here where if you took uh, the d6 template and laid out the four well maybe we do the d4 and you lay out the four colors um, and it would determine which of the four corners you go to 
and then you can try to uh, since we're since the concept is sort of a territory control maybe you roll the die and if you get a before we even get super complicated we can oh, that's not what I wanted maybe you roll the die if I'm playing green and it's my turn I roll the die and I get a one so I have the option of moving one of my guys to the one space I will, maybe I don't want to move one out of my green space because I want to make sure that I have at least two guys there. On my next turn, I roll three. Well, now I can move one of my guys back or something to that effect. <clears throat> um, but I don't really have a goal in this game yet. So how do you eliminate other players? Well, maybe you outnumber them in their corner. So maybe red is out there. Well, OK, no, this would be blue. So maybe this happens, and I roll the die, and I got a four. So I can take this guy off of one, drop him into four. Now I get the blue guy and that ter territory is mine. If you're in your own territory, maybe they don't get captured. You can only capture them when they're in their own territory. Oops. You can delete the Minotaur. Delete all that. Pull the blue guy back out. Uh, there's also options. You could have a bowl. If you wanted to keep pieces in a bowl. Maybe lock that down so people can't grab the bowl by accident and spill all your pieces. There's a lock option. Well, it seems to do a pretty good job of not spilling everything out. Oh yeah, all the all the pieces seem to just sort of lock in place. It's actually pretty nifty. Uh, these are backgammon pieces, reverse high chips, mahjong tiles. If you like mahjong, if you could find a a use for the mahjong game without playing actual Mahjong. Or, you can get rid of all of this if you're a fan of RPGs. Delete everything off of there. If you're a fan of RPGs, maybe you want to set up uh, a dungeon for your players. These options are also available. Uh, the nice thing about the tiles, they, uh, they have a snap to grid there's a snap to grid option um, if you want to make sure that nothing happens where if you bump tiles then they go off kilter <clears throat> like they just did when I dropped in this end piece um, at the beginning they were all sort of snapping to a nice grid alignment but then when I changed the angle of one of the pieces it sort of started throwing everything else off uh, you can lock the items, the walls down as you go. You can do that en masse if you don't want to do it one at a time. I think there's actually uh, a key for locking them down 
but I don't know if it's uh, grid projection. Should this object receive grid lines projected onto it? Okay, I don't know what that means offhand. Um, Motor rays, grid, snap. You can make it so that it's not selected when you're dragging. Uh, so you'd have to drag it specifically. Or select it specifically. I set these all to lock. Um, I think it's shift L or just L. Okay. So that's very handy. So then as you're drawing, uh, dragging these tiles out, you can hit L before you move on to the next thing. And then it'll lock it in place. If you mess up with any of your placements, you just hit L while hovering over it again. And you can then move it where you want it. Um, there is an option of if you have something sitting on top of one of your tiles or any piece, you can make it so that when you pick up the tile below it or the object below it, um, objects above it will be attached to it. So probably similar to how the bowl worked. So when I did that, because the, the ground tile was not set to sticky, the table did not move with it. However, once I added sticky back onto it, the table then moved with the tile, which can be very handy, especially if you uh, have a lot of chips on a board that you want to move around. Um, I know there's a lot of more complicated games out there where you have tableaus with lots of different indicators and markers. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, useful options in Tabletop Simulator that will help you accomplish with what you set out to accomplish. Um, which I think makes it a very powerful tool for uh, creators, uh, game creators. Uh, or even just casual creators, you know, you don't have to be an expert getting into the field if you just wanted to make a game as a hobby, if you just wanted to make something to screw around with friends. Um, Tabletop Simulator gives you a lot of nice options, like putting a tree in your dungeon right next to this nice rock. Obviously, you'd set it up in a more aesthetically pleasing way, but these are all things that you have the ability to decide for yourself. Um, also, as far as the RPG kit goes, uh, most of the uh, creatures have multiple modes that you can activate. The twanging sound. Is that the sound you're talking about? I think that's the sound of the, the ground tiles. But um, Tabletop Simulator can also be very useful for creating your RPG. Uh, you can make a much more, much more engaging campaign in, in the respect that um, you can show uh, characters in different states, you can show them in animations, uh, you can kind of get an idea of size. The bear walks, uh, you've got all kinds of, of options available. <clears throat> the, each of these characters have a uh, 
a toggle for their mode, which you can use hotkeys 1, 2, and 3. There's the, if you press 2 while hovering over them, they'll do some kind of attack. If you press 3 while over them, they die. And that's how a lot of these are set up. Oops. So if you were into some kind of RPGing, I must be on a pretty, pretty big delay. Um, this could be a very good tool for you. I actually, I think it would be really neat to design a campaign. Um, I don't think you'd be able to do it like this. You might need to, VR might need to be a part of it. Um, but I think it would be neat if you could have uh, your players shrunk down so that they're, you know, looking around at the walls and the tiles uh, around you and actually look at the thing that you're fighting from that size. I can't really get a good angle on it from, uh, from what I'm doing here. Actually. I wonder if I could view, like, do a view as, view from their, the character's perspective. I think that would be really neat. I, if there's a way to do it, I'm not sure how. But, um, yeah, overall, I'm running short on time, but overall, this is a very... It's a very flexible tool. Uh, you can make game concepts very quickly. Um, there's so many, an infinite amount of possibilities, really. Um, the possibilities are endless. Uh, the only limit is your own imagination. And you can make if you can't find the game of your dreams, maybe you can make the game of your dreams. And Tabletop Simulator will, to some extent, help you achieve that. You also have the options of adding different tables, uh, which may or may not be important uh, to you as a player. But the shape of the table could, could affect how people are seated around it. Uh, you can apply decals to the table if you want something funky on the table. I believe this lets you move player positions around. Um, you can chain objects together, uh, just attach them, put them on a joint, put them on a hinge joint, put them on a spring so when you pull one, the other kind of springs along behind it. Uh, flick is just if you have a component <clears throat> if you have a component out on the board whoops take out flick click the object and drag away from it and you'll thrust the object across the world um, you could potentially use tabletop simulator if you if you really got into it uh, for like wargaming I know wargaming has a lot of measurement to determine whether or not you're close enough to hit uh, your other your opponent's pieces um, and it lets you measure things apparently it also lets you ping on the battlefield I'm not sure how to use the 3D measuring. Um, you can create zones. Uh, if you create a zone, uh, in this respect, you can hide what's in the zone. 
um, which would also be good for RPGs because you can create fog of war if you don't want your player characters to know what's in an area before they get to it. You could hide it so that from from the player's perspective uh, they would not be able to see what's in it. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, zones could be used for for multitude of different things. I don't know what the layout thing does. If I'm honest. Um. <clears throat> uh, so if you left click on the object while you're in this mode. You can hide pointers that go into it. Uh, you can hide things from specific players. Opposing players' pointers will be hidden in the area. Hiding objects will be reversed so everyone but the color of the area can see inside. So if you wanted to create some kind of game where your pieces are hidden from you, but not from everybody else. You could use reverse hiding. Um, so let's see what this looks like. So I set them to not be see-through, so they just end up looking like boxes. Um, if I were to Hello. Oh, right. You have to have that. The zone selected. Uh, so if I set that to orange, then we can see what that looks like from orange's perspective. <clears throat> so the white box is still opaque to me, but I can see into the orange box. Uh, promo not intended for orange box. Um, there's the pen. You can draw on stuff. It's useful for pointing at things. Uh, lots of different options for drawing shapes. Uh, when you erase, you erase whole segments. Um, you can put your rules in the notebook. Uh, people can put their own notes into the rules. Um, and you can make it so only, well, I guess generally only the player who put the notes in there can see it. Um, you can create specific notes for different players, uh, or you can put it as gray so that everybody can see it. Um, and then if you wanted to upload at the end of it, if you've got a game that's half decent, uh, you've got some, you splashed some artwork on there, made it look nice, then you can upload it to the Steam Workshop so that uh, other people can play your game and see your genius. At work, you just need a title, give it a description so people know what they're getting into, and give it a nice thumbnail so that it's eye-catching when people are browsing through the workshop. Uh, you can also add tags, how long does the game take, how many players can play. Uh, there's actual game tags. Uh, there's lots that are pre-made. You should probably tag it if it's language specific. Um, and I'm sure the community frowns on if things are poorly tagged, like if it's if you put war game but it's a very family friendly game of just like uh, you know, Candyland. Uh, people probably won't be super happy if you labeled it as war games. Um, 
And then just because you, you upload your game doesn't mean that that's the end. You can also go to the update workshop. You would just have to get the workshop ID from where your mod is, supply it there. Um, if you want to upload a new thumbnail, you can upload it here and then update it. And I think you have to do these steps within the game itself. I don't know if you can make those changes from the Steam Workshop menu itself. And yeah, I think as far as basic overviews go, that's pretty much all I have to talk about. Um, there's a, a lot of a lot of complexity to the creation portion of Tabletop Simulator. It gives you a lot of power, but it doesn't. It, it's not going to make your game for you. It gives you the tools you need to build your game. And I think it's a very uh, interesting tool that everybody can use. And even if you don't end up publishing your game, if you just put it on Tabletop Simulator for you and some of your friends and some strangers who found your game through the workshop to play, I think that makes it all worth it. So yeah, uh, I've been Sinistar. I hope you enjoyed me babble on about different tools in Tabletop Simulator. And uh, yeah, go, go make your dream game. <laughs>